came to Christchurch to talk about earthquakes, and there's no better place in the world, I would say, than to talk about earthquakes. In particular, I want to give you hope. So, if we look at the photo of the New Zealand islands, it looks so peaceful and placid. You see Christchurch on the left side. But on certain days, occasionally, the earth speaks to us with a very violent voice. And you, many of you have gone through this experience. I would like to present you with the question, what if we would be able to see these earthquakes coming days before they arrive? Now, I worked for the past 30 years at uh, NASA in California. Before this, I was a professor in Germany. And during that time, I was doing things that had no relationship at the beginning to earthquakes. I was studying single crystals together to launch the part with my son, Mino, who was a director of nanotechnology and advanced space science in uh, NASA Ames, and he passed away not long ago from a brain tumor. So much of what I'm saying is in honor of my collaboration with him. I started out working on very, very simple single crystals, totally, as I said, unrelated, never dreaming that what I would be working on could one day have influence and importance for understanding earthquakes. Magnesium oxide, the simplest um, oxide material that exists and I worked on it for a number of years. And I discovered something that everybody else had overlooked, had missed. And that is a defect, a type of defect in these crystals, and I should say a defect in our world of solid state physics is something that occurs, not, it's not a crack, it is something on the atomic, on the subatomic. What I discovered was that in the crystal structure, like here on the lower left side, there are these defects that are totally invisible. We are have, still now, we have no way how to directly observe these peroxy defects. But when we do nasty things to the crystal, they fall apart and produce electric charge carriers. Then I found the same kind of defects in other materials, including natural minerals, either from the crust or from the earth mantle. Almost every mineral seems to have these. And if minerals have them, then of course rocks will have them. So now I want to show you what you can do when you play around with rocks. So here you see a four meter long piece of granite in my laboratory at NASA Ames. And all what I'm doing here is I put some contacts to the rock at the far end, and the contact up here, and I squeeze here. In the moment I start squeezing here, a current starts to flow through the unstressed rock. And if I put an amp meter, a pico amp meter in the circuit, I can measure an electric current. And here you see, this example measured from this particular four meter long piece of granite. In the moment, the green curve is the load. In the moment I start to load the rock, a current begins to flow. The current rises very, very rapidly at low stress levels, saturates, stays constant. Actually, we have measured this over months the current continues to flow if we keep it uh, loaded, and if we unload, the current goes away. Now, those of you who have maybe heard about how semiconductors work, this is a behavior that is reminiscent of sem semiconductor, the things from which you build transistors and hence available in all electronics. Here at the bottom, you see the schematic on the right-hand side, the stress activates electrons and holes, 
holes is a name for the defect electrons. These are electronic particles that are generated and that are actually necessary to be able to produce a transistor. And the, we found out that the electrons have to stay in, this, in the stress rock volume while the holes can flow out. They flow out at about 100 meter per second, which is about the speed of a jet landing in an, air, in an airport. They are very fast. They are propagate through it. And in this particular experiment, the electrons have to come around through the wire and shake hands at the front end of this rock. Now this is a combination of a semiconductor behavior, the formation of electrons and holes, and of an electrochemical battery. That means we can separate the positive holes flowing through the rock from the electron, from the negative holes that flow through the wire. This is exciting and this is new. So now let's do a Gedanken experiment Take this rock and imagine that it would be sitting vertically in the Earth's crust and that this rock is not four meters long but a kilometer, five kilometer, ten kilometers long, thirty, fifty, a hundred kilometers long if we are in a subduction zone like you have it here on the North Island. If that end of that volume of rock is being stressed by the enormous tectonic forces in the Earth, electricity is generated and under certain conditions this electricity flows out of the stressed rock volume and into the surrounding rock. And we have means to see these things flowing over distance of tens of kilometers under natural conditions. These are amazing processes that had never before been properly understood. Now, if these holes, because they are so unusual in behavior, have been given the name positive holes. I didn't give it, a good friend of mine uh, gave it in, already in the 1990s. So if a current flows through something, there's always generates a magnetic field. If this current is constant and strong enough, even if it flows in 10 or 20 or 30 kilometer depth, we can measure the change in the magnetic field at the Earth's surface. If the current fluctuates, which it most often do, does, then it produces, it becomes an antenna emitting radio, radio waves, and the ultra-low frequency portion of these radio waves can travel through tens of kilometers of rocks. We can measure it. And then you see here up uh, unipolar pulses, and these are amazing. I will show an example afterwards. If these charges flow into water, chemistry takes place, electrochemistry, the water becomes stoichiometrically oxidized to hydrogen peroxide, the stuff you put on your skin when you have a scratch. You change the chemistry of water, change the cation and iron, Anion content, you change the fluorescence spectrum of the dissolved organic that is dissolved in all groundwater and river waters. Then there are ground potential building up that we can measure. When we see this ground potential building up, if they reach a certain threshold, we start to see um, ionization of the air. First, positive ions are formed over an area about 100 or 200 kilometers wide, suddenly the air becomes full of positive air ions. At the same time, we see carbon monoxide seeping out of the ground. If the Earth continues to stress and more and more charge gas come, we start triggering corona discharges. In the lab, we can photograph these little corona discharges. Out in nature, they instantly form negative air ions, so we can measure the ne negative air ion content from ozone and other uh, side products. And on the left side, you see there the infrared emission. I will also show you an example of this. And then there are many, many perturbations in the uppermost atmosphere, 100 to 200, 300 kilometers above the ground, which have been reported 
extensively in the literature, but very few people, or no, I would almost say nobody really understood how these things are being generated. So all these things we can now use to learn something about the stress state of rocks deep below our feet, far beyond the direct reach, we have to deduce their presence from these indirect measurements. We can establish these causality ranges linked together by chemistry and by physics. So I wanted to briefly mention this infrared emission. The infrared emission is when the charge carriers come to the surface, they can recombine. During this recombination, uh, these charge carriers release energy, and these two oxygens on, that you show there up, they become suddenly about 20,000 degrees hot vibrationally, and they emit bursts of infrared radiation. But one characteristic feature that these charge carriers try to accumulate mostly on mountaintops, on <coughs> hillsides, not in the valley. So now I want to show you here a result from a PhD thesis of Luca Pirotti in Italy, who had analyzed, I think, 18 months of Italy. Every night he looked for these uh, anomalies. And pr uh, prior to this earthquake in L'Aquila in 2009, he identified this anomaly that you see here in red. And here's a photograph of L'Aquila, a medieval town that was heavily damaged with the loss of life of more than 300 people. And to the left and to the right, there are mountain ranges. Uh, one, the Gran Sasso, are the highest mountains in the middle of, of Italy. And in the next slide, you will see draped over exactly the same, this map of the thermal infrared anomalies as they are measured three days before that disastrous earthquake. So if anybody would have had the funding and the knowledge to analyze and how important the analysis is of these phenomena in real time, three days before the earthquake, they would have issued a warning and said, something is brewing, something must be happening 10, 20 kilometers below our feet. Now, next I want to talk about these unipolar pulses. Unipolar pulses are strange phenomenon that suddenly, within a fraction of a second, enormous energy, electromagnetic energy, is emitted from deep below, only about 100, 150, 200 milliseconds long, shoots up and comes down with a little wiggle and disappears. They are not yet fully understood. We're working on it. Now here, a situation where a friend of mine, colleague, Jorge Hero, is, has operated for the past two and a half years, a station consisting of two search coil magnetometers, extremely uh, sensitive. And what you see there is in the subduction zone, there is a, a ridge, a submarine ridge. That's where earthquakes are being generated. That ridge is subducted and disappears underneath the edge of the South American continent. Now here is, I think it is running, so um, here again the map, and you will see in a moment uh, how these, these unipolar pulses are generated. And they're, they are marked here by, this is a period of about two weeks that you see displayed, and here they come. A few 10 minutes distance from each other in, in groups. Then there is a day, a day and a half of silence, no unipolar pulse. The next group is coming. Again, a little silent, or there is another blip from somewhere far away. And then there is a third group of these pulses coming. By now, we have 2,500, more than 2,500 of these pulses, and they were associated with 22 magnitude 4 earthquakes, 3.5 to 4 earthquakes that happened in this subduction zone between a depth of 25 to 65 kilometers. And they were, Jorge Hero is able to predict a time window of 40 hours, three to six days in advance, depositing the information in a closed envelope with the president of his university 
And in all 22 cases that he has analyzed, he was right. So it's quite remarkable. <laughs> Can we come to the next slide, please? It doesn't... Oh, yeah. So I've started my presentation with asking what if we can see earthquakes coming. And I think I can say, hope I've convinced you that by understanding the physics, and this is really new physics, of how rocks respond deep below to the increase of stress, and how what they are producing electricity, and how this electricity uh, propagates through the Earth's crust, we can learn about the buildup of stress, and we will be able to say, yes, we can see them coming days before they, are, uh, they will arrive. We cannot be sure that every stress buildup will reach to an earthquake, because sometimes the Earth says, I don't feel like rupturing, I feel like sliding. <laughs> then we see the precursors, and people would say, you have had a false alarm. No, we have not had a false alarm. The Earth just had another day, another feeling. But in most cases, one thing which can make for sure, in the future, there will be no major earthquake that will hit any place in the world where we have the capability of, of measuring these precursory signals, will hit unannounced, unforewarned. So the element of utter surprise that has been a plague until recently, and including the Christchurch uh, earthquakes, will be over. Thank you so much. <laughs>